kind of a fluid concept. And that's one of the harder things with this class and kind of putting it together. Is literally when you're working at looking at material to put together in a class like this, everything can apply and then nothing can apply. So it's kind of a matter of how hard you want to kind of narrow it down and how much you want to define it. But we're going to kind of keep it open-ended. Um, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, this is a very conversational class, so I want your input as much as, I was about to say as much as I want to hear my own, but that sounds really interesting. But I want your input, I want your opinions about stuff. This is designed to be a very topical, engaging type of conversational class. So if I have to stay here with you quicker for longer than 20 seconds, it's going to get really awkward really fast. So we'll hopefully just kind of move forward and push forward. I hope it'll be a fun quarter. Wednesday night, we're going to start apps. And so you can flip it back over, and you'll have it available for you then. Before we begin, though, I'm going to ask Colton, if he doesn't mind, to lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as we enter into this class time. We pray that Brady would present this lesson in a way that even the youngest of ears in here might understand. We pray that everything we do here this morning be in accordance with thy will. We pray for the ones of our number that aren't able to be with us. We pray that you help them get back with us no matter whatever is hindering them from being here. We pray for those that are traveling this time of the year as it is the travel season. And we pray that you bring them back to us at the next point in time, if it be thy will. Father, we pray that as we go through life, we do everything right that's right in our eyes, and we pray that we please you so that one day we might have the hope of eternal life with you in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I want to begin this entire <coughs> forum by asking the most obvious and most basic question, which is, what is a disciple? If you were trying to define disciple, what is a disciple to you? Yes? It is a follower. That's it. We can call the class right now. It is a follower. That's basically the idea. What else is a disciple? Because that's kind of the main core idea. What is a disciple? Problems with the Jews' statement in this passage, the first and biggest one being they say that we're 
never been enslaved to anyone. You can kind of suppress laughter when they say something like that. But what's the other problem with their whole lifestyle when they say that we're Abraham's descendants? Because Jesus calls them out on it. That's basically what the rest of John chapter 8 is about. But what's the problem with their statement when they say that we're Abraham's descendants? They didn't live like it, exactly. So you can't say we're Abraham's descendants when you don't do anything similar to what Abraham does. That's the point that Jesus would make. He even calls them sons, of, I think in this passage, maybe it's in John 6, he calls them sons of the devil. When you look at John 8, verses 31 to 32, this is the foundational principle. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In order to be Christ's disciple, you have to walk <coughs> You have to follow Christ, exactly. And that's why when everybody gets, you know, all up in a, you know, kind of in a fuss about, well, faith only, and once saved, always saved, and all the different things that don't make any sense when you really start to think about it, that's why all of them kind of fall to the wayside. Because at its core, a Christian is somebody who obeys God, regardless of whether or not it leads to salvation, and I'm not trying to minimize that point, but at its core, a Christian is somebody who obeys God. You can't really get away from that point when you just look at Scripture. John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. It's another kind of similar passage along your lines. John chapter 18, starting in verse 34. Actually, starting in verse 33. <clears throat> he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you where I'm going, you cannot come. This is him prophesying about his death. Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have also loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. What's another core foundational principle of discipleship? Not just obedience. Love. Love, exactly. That you... Right, love covers everything. That's a very denominational sounding term, but you're exactly right. Love does cover everything. It's the Right. Motivation. You were making fun of me yesterday with my voice, not even making fun of you. Yeah, it's the motivation by which we obey. You can see that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to touch on that during the lesson this morning. If I do all these things and don't have love, it profits me nothing. What does he mean, though, when he says in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another? A lot of people have seen that and kind of gone way on the deep end. Why does he call that a new commandment? The 
idea of discipleship is a process. It's not something that at any point in time you can say, I have fully stopped being a disciple. Because if the idea of a disciple is somebody who takes or hears something and then puts it into their lifestyle, there's never an end point to that process. And that's a very intense point that we need to make. Because sometimes people say, well, I've learned everything I need to know, or I'm just going to kind of sit on autopilot. If you're sitting here this morning and you've stopped growing, if you've stopped learning, if you've stopped putting things into action, then you are by definition not a disciple of Christ. Because a disciple is something that's very active. And I think sometimes we overlook that idea when we talk about the nature of discipleship. Do we have any thoughts or comments? Hey, let me ask you this. Is it possible to have discipleship without Jesus? Is it possible to be a Christian without following Christ? Joyce says no. For the sake of argument, I'm going to leave it open. Is it possible to be, well, maybe in your course, uh, is it possible to be a Christian without following Christ? Okay, Jason still says no, even when I put it in your books. That's the nature of the question. I can't give it away. <coughs> Exactly, that's a good answer. In truth, there is no way to be a Christian without following Christ. Both jo Joyce and Jason are right on that. But do some people do that anyways? Where they say, well, I'm a Christian, but they're really not following Christ. How do people do that? How do we do that? I don't, and I'm trying really hard not to make it a us versus them in How do we do that? How does the world do that? Okay, it's what they feel is right instead of what they know is right. How else do we do that? We pick and choose which things about Christ we want to follow and leave some things out. Right, we maybe have a buffet or a Burger King style religion where we try to have it our way. Yeah. How else do we do it? <coughs> right. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's like saying I'm happy with my food. That makes me vegetarian. Well, that doesn't really... That doesn't really go together. Right. I'm a good moral person. That means obviously God loves me. I think that's the truth of that. Yes. <coughs> we, sometimes we think we're finished. And that is true. And that's that kind of goes with the whole lifelong order part. And, and somebody mentioned it earlier. I think it was Jeff that mentioned that it's um, it, 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 that it's a discipline. Or maybe Joe said that. The same word that we get disciples is where we get discipline from. So it is that kind of idea of something that you're following, something that you're putting into practice. But you're right, sometimes we think, well, now that I'm baptized, that's it. I can just kind of sit and just kind of listen. And as long as I take the words up, I don't have a piano behind me, then everything's fine. And that is so far below what it means to be a disciple that it's not even really worth mentioning. But you're right, sometimes we do have that attitude. How else do we try to be Christians without following Christ? Right, yeah, I think we... I think a lot of the world, you know, outside of the church, they have established, you know, just a natural tendency where they highlight the sins. And maybe you may think that, well, I hadn't killed anybody. And, yeah. You know, I've only committed adultery or, you know, that I'm good. Right. Because they, and they'll be, so a lot of times they'll throw games uh, at you. Mm -hmm. And any of the, you know, anyone in the Bible that had, Multiple lives, they'll say, Well, that's okay. They'll, check, they'll, yeah. they'll take things out of context to justify <coughs> the behavior. But, you know, with the, with the hierarchy of sins that we have established, or that man has established, that's how they, you know, justify Christianity to yeah. understand. I think, you're, I think you're right on that. Some people kind of create this hierarchy of sin, and for people who are trying to justify polygamy, they may break out the day with, you know, yeah. multiple wives. And even as we talked about in our Wednesday night class when we just, just got done discussing Solomon, there's a difference in the way that Solomon approached sin and David approached sin, and that's kind of a bigger conversation for another time. But you're right, sometimes we do establish a hierarchy. I didn't, I didn't, I haven't murdered anybody, I haven't cheated on my wife, I haven't driven slow in the left lane, and so therefore God must be okay with me. When in reality, God hasn't made that type of designation. And you're right, sometimes we have kind of our own reward and you know punishment kind of response to this. I think a lot of us sometimes when we talk about this idea of being Christian without Christ, we kind of miss the bigger things. For instance, we can have an attachment to a system. We can have an attachment to some kind of religious system that I put in place. And I think the hierarchy of sins kind of goes along with that. I'm living by my own rules. I'm living by this kind of arbitrary thing that I've decreed. Some people would say, well, I'm giving my devotion to a person. You see, you know, Catholics are big on this idea. 
Pope is kind of the figurehead. He has the same type of authority. But Protestants do it too. People that put their unfeigned faith kind of in people like Joel Osteen, John Calvin, Martin Luther, these type of people. Some people say, well, a group is who I'm really devoted to, the Assembly of the Seventy, if you're uh, talking Mormons. And I think some people also put it in knowledge. I don't really need to follow Christ because why? And this is when it kind of leans more towards the academic side of being a disciple. I don't really need to follow Christ, and nobody would ever say this, but why? I read 10 books a day. I could tell you the Greek word for baptism 100 times over. And so there's really no need for me to go out and do that stuff because this is more my sphere. And this is where you get to the whole, that's not my thing. Evangelism isn't my thing. Talking to people isn't my thing. Being a disciple isn't my thing. My thing is blank. And so when we talk about being a Christian without Christ, we can somehow kind of subvert Jesus and move to things that look like Christ instead of actually being Christ. And that's a really important point I think we need to make about this. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 11 to see how easy this kind of finds its way. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Or read the first four verses. St. Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 1, he says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. This is, by the way, Paul being sarcastic. But indeed, you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you. This is where he's not being sarcastic. I am jealous for you with the godly jealousy, for I betroth you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid, verse 3, that as the serpent deceived thee by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. What's the key word in that verse, personally? <coughs> the key words, rather. Deceived is a good one. Yeah. What else is the key? What else are the key words? I'm sorry. Corrupted is a good one. Devotion has two key words. What else would you say are key words? Simplicity. Thank you. That's what I was waiting for. Why does he call it the simplicity of following Jesus Christ? There's really only one way. Is, is being, is knowing God's will hard? Let's put it that way. Is knowing what God wants from us hard? <coughs> no, thank you. I'm going to lean over here because obviously this is where my people are at. Even though you're making fun of me, we don't have to talk about the past. <laughs> so many, so much of the world puts levels in place. Right. It's, not it, it's exactly right. It's not. It's not about these levels, or these kind of arbitrary systems. To know the will of God is not hard. You can look at Scripture. You can see it. You can read about it. The problem becomes when we begin to say, "Yeah, but," or "What about?" or when we try to kind of make our arbitrary kind of decisions. And that's why when you look at Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse three, it just jumps out at me. The simple, the the simple, the simplicity, the purity of Jesus Christ is there. But you were led astray. Now listen to what he mentions in verse 4. If one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. In other words, the gospel is there, but what's happened? Other people have come in and done what? Changed it. Changed it, or obviously you can't change the gospel, but I know what you mean by that. They've come in and done what to it? They distorted it maybe a little bit. Once again, you can't distort the gospel like the bone. It's pure. It's fresh. Right. They add things on top of it to kind of make it look distorted. And I know that's what y'all are going for, too. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Joe was exactly right. They kind of lay things on top of it. Matthew chapter 15, to me, is one of the most blatant explanations of this idea. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Matthew 15, starting verse 1, he says, And some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. A collective gasp falls over everybody. Verse 3, he answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? That's a perfect response. Verse 4, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father and mother, Whatever I have that will help you has been given to God, he is not to honor his father and mother. And by this you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your traditions. What were these people doing in Matthew chapter 15? They were kind of hitting out. Right. 
you know, just one parent to but if you cite this. Right. <laughs> exactly. They were adding else to it. The law says, honor your father and mother. And what were these people doing? They were listening to that and saying, well, you don't have to what? I hear this ringing around. Basically, they want to take care of the parents. Right. Somebody. Yes, they were giving it to God. Just sing a lot of preaching. But you're right. God uh, had. Oh, rituals. I might have said rituals. There was a showdown at 1045. Right. God is saying, look, this is the way it is. Honor your father and mother. These people are coming and saying, well, you can do that, but if you don't really want to do that, you can do this instead. So they subvert the word of God by kind of implementing their own thing. And that's exactly. <coughs> verses 1 through 6 is a completely separate kind of issue. It's the same thing, but it's a separate issue. From the first three verses, because the, the apostles or the Pharisees and the scribes are coming in verses two and saying, Why do they break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they can't eat bread. Verse three, what does Jesus say back to them? <laughs> right. <clears throat> right. We may have broken a tradition, but you've done what? You've broken a commandment of God. So, in implementing another system that they overlaid on top of Christianity, they subverted the word of God and replaced it with something that they wanted to be a part of. And so when we talk about the issue of whether or not you can be a Christian without following Christ, the answer is technically no, you can't do that. But otherwise, it's a resounding yes. And people do it all the time. We make up rules that God hasn't made up. We make up, make up opinions that God hasn't made up. And we implement them and we force them on people that God has not designed them to be forced upon at all. I think that's a really important point that we need to make. Yes. And I think that's why Paul brought up Eve in that passage you just read in 2 Corinthians. Because that's what Satan told Eve. He said, oh, God said you're going to die. Well, you won't really die. Right. And so that's, I mean, that's what Jesus is trying to, you know, I think he did a great job paralleling those two passages. Uh, because Jesus is telling them, <laughs> you're, not, you're missing the whole point. Right. You're, you're trying to take what I've said and skew it or water it down or dilute it or however you want to, whatever term you want to use to make it more about how it fits you versus how I want it to be. Right. Which is the essence of idolatry. To say, well, I'm going to serve God, but I'm also going to serve these other things. And these are things I really want to do, but I'm going to put them as equal importance with what God says. And that's why over and over again, the word, the, idol the idea of idolatry is pounded into their skulls throughout right? all the minor prophets, all the major prophets, is you're, you're seeking yourself, not seeking me. If you were seeking me, your, your worship would look totally different. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Let me ask you this question to kind of carry on this conversation. What does it mean to be a disciple? We can talk about what is a disciple all day long. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean on practical, boots on the ground, everyday life? To take action. I'm sorry, from the deep beyond? To take action. To take action, yeah. To actually put it into practice, yeah. What else does it mean to be a disciple on everyday life? <clears throat> to implement a teacher until you resemble them. Simulate a teacher until you resemble them. That's true. I was kind of looking for more kind of practical application, everyday kind of language, but that's true. To emulate a teacher until you resemble them. What does it cost you? What does it look like? What does it mean to you as an individual? Or what can it mean? Focus solely on the plan. Right. Right, everything about your core, that's a little bit of what Zach was mentioning, everything about your core, everything about your focus is on the thing that you're emulating. So yeah, you're exactly right. What can it mean to you? Service. I'm sorry? Service. This is the first comment you made in class, thank you. It does mean service, putting yourself in the service of other people, humbling yourself. Yeah, what else? Means you, have to give up you have to give up stuff, exactly. Kind of every day, you know, this is what I look so like, this is what I don't like anymore because I've changed, yeah. There's, and I would take that a step further, there's always sacrifice. There's always, and maybe some are big things like your life, some are smaller things like your hobbies, whatever it is, there's always some kind of sacrifice. I want you to look at Mark chapter 1. <coughs> Mark does a good job of kind of showing this attitude, I think, than the other gospel writers do. Or at least this one specific point. <coughs> Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16. This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was baptized there in verses 9 down to verse 13. When you look at verse 16, though, this is right as he's kind of reaching out to other people. 
Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16, it says, As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting it in the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, if you underline or highlight, that's a great word to highlight or underline. Immediately they left the nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, who were also in the boat, men in the nets. Notice the word again, verse 20. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and went away to follow him. Who are we looking at here, Mark 1, 16 through 20? <coughs> Who's the topics of discussion? Who are the topics? Men that would be apostles. Men that would be apostles. Those are different names, but you're right. Men that would eventually be apostles. Who are these people? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. You have to sing it. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Yes. These <laughs> are, what does it say about these four men? Whenever Jesus showed up and said to them, follow me, what happens? They followed him. They followed him, exactly. You see this twice in this passage. You see it once in verse 18. You see it again in verse 20. Are these the only people that did this? There's one more slot. So you know there has to be one more. Can go on a limb like everyone said, maybe no. Who else did this? Didn't believe it was apostles. Matthew, exactly, or Levi, as he's also known. Right, Matthew did the exact same thing. In Mark chapter 2, verse 14, he got up and followed him. But you notice in Mark's gospel, something you don't see in the other gospels, at least in kind of this nice neat package, is you see Jesus calling these people to come follow him. They immediately get up and go their way and follow him. They leave jobs, they leave in the case of James and uh, John, they leave the father. So they leave things to go follow him. Here's the question though. Could they have stayed Christians and still been fishermen? Somebody said yes over here. There's a little tiny voice. Sure. Yes. Why does he emphasize this in Mark chapter 1? That they got up and they left and they left everything and followed him. Because they're not just going to be Christians. Right. They're going to be the ones that establish the Right. They're not just going to be Christians. And I think that's why the Gospel writer goes to this extent. They're not just going to be quote unquote regular Christians, they're going to be apostles. But it is possible to be a disciple and still be all these other types of things. But what he's showing here is the fact that sometimes it requires sacrifice. Sometimes it requires leaving everything to follow for God. And that's, you know, we hesitate sometimes when we talk about discipleship, when we talk about obedience, we hesitate sometimes to dial it to the extreme that God wants us to. When he says in the Sermon on the Mount, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, we have a tendency sometimes to dial those down and say, well, God really doesn't mean that. And I agree, I don't think God actually wants you to chop off your arm, otherwise you wouldn't have created in the first place. But we, in doing that, what do we also do? When we say, well, God really doesn't want you to go that extreme. Right, we go too far the other, other extreme, we say, well, God really wants you to just kind of be happy and comfortable and just kind of be yourself, and you can be a Christian kind of on the side. Yes. It's kind of like the analogy of the pig and the chicken involved with breakfast. You're big on analogies that I don't understand. You, don't, you haven't heard that? Once <laughs> again, no, I don't. <laughs> the hen and the pig are both involved in the breakfast meal, but the hen is involved, but the pig is committed to it. That's a very morbid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really comfortable with that. <laughs> and you're right about that. Yeah, one is, and that's actually a really good point. One is devoted, one's actually giving their life. So, yeah, I think that's an excellent application. Well, you also have a death scenario. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's a really good analogy. I hadn't really heard that, uh, at least that way. Um, what he's emphasizing here in Mark 1 is he's emphasizing the idea of something new. And that's, when we talk about discipleship, it needs to be something that's new. And he mentions it literally in the next chapter. Look at Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 18, for instance, this is kind of talking about something else. It's about old law, new law, that kind of relationship. But when you look at Mark chapter 2, notice what he mentions here. He says in verse 18, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. They came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples don't fast. And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come, verse 20, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Now, I know what Mark 2 and verse 18 through 20 is talking about. It's talking about the old law, the new law. You can't fast when Jesus is staying right there. Fasting is morning. Jesus is right there. So you mourn about. The old law can be you know, fulfilled in the new law, that whole discussion. But look what he says in verse 21 22. I think this has a lot of bearing in discipleship. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth in an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine in the old skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skins as well, but one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. What's the teaching there in verses 21 and 22? Right, 
Right. If you put a patch on, if you put a new patch on something that's old, eventually what's going to happen to the patch? It's going to tear. If you put new one in the old mine skin, what's going to happen with it? It's going to also tear exactly. What's the application for us in terms of discipleship? Right. You can exactly. You cannot combine an old mine. Now there may be some things that carry over here, job, for instance, and stuff like that, but you can't combine an old life set of values and hopes and dreams and principles into a new life type of way. And I think that's why over and over again you see this idea of the rebirth, the renewing of your mind. There's so much new involved with that. And you also see, for instance, in James 4 when he talks about adulterers and adulteresses, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So you can't become a disciple and still hold on to all your old values and your old morals <coughs> and old principles. If those things are anti-God, you have to put those things away. But also, to another extent, it talks about the teacher. Right. Like the new Christians are the old Jewish tradition. Right. Yeah, and we didn't talk, that's actually in my notes, we didn't talk about that, but I think that's a really good point, because there are lots of people saying, well, you have to be circumcised, you have to the Sabbath, all these different things, but God obviously says you don't have to, and that's kind of the point of Acts chapter 15, but people are trying to introduce the old alongside the new, and it just doesn't work, and I think that's the argument of Acts 15, kind of in a nutshell. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments on that? Okay, turn over to Luke 9. You knew we were going to get here in a bit, this is kind of the foundational, how do you foundational? Yeah. This is kind of the base verse that we can build everything off of. I'm all about foundation today, you can tell from the lesson that we've discussed in a little bit. In Luke chapter 9, though, this is the passage everybody turns to when we discuss discipleship, starting in verse 57. You have three men that show up to Jesus, and they have different responses and different statements. Look at verse 57. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first for me to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said to them, no one after putting his hand in the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Whether these three people show up at the same time to Jesus or whether they represent archetypes of the disciples of Jesus, I don't to say. But nevertheless, you have three different people that show up to Jesus. And what does the first one say? I will follow you wherever you go. What does Jesus say back to this one? In essence, the cost is high. The cost is high, exactly. What does Jesus not say to him? And this is a part that sometimes I'm really big things interesting. What does Jesus not do with this person? Right. He doesn't he doesn't say, come on and go. Yeah. He doesn't try to just drag him along. Yeah. Which by the way, everything in Luke 9, 57 through 62 is a PR nightmare for Jesus if you were kind of modern. You don't just do this to people that are willing to follow you. What does he not do though? That's true too. He doesn't tell them, uh, you know, the box set falls and birds of nest, but the some man is no to lay his head, but heaven is there. He doesn't say that. Yeah. What else does he not do? He doesn't force them, he doesn't drag them. It's a little bit of what Jeff mentioned. He also doesn't keep them at arm's length and push them away and say, right. no, you're not going to follow me, I have the work to do. Exactly. And that's. I'm, and that's that's the thing that I keep coming back to about this passage. He doesn't drag it. I think that's important to point out. He doesn't try to you know, twist his arm, but he also doesn't discourage him. He doesn't tell him not to follow him. What is he doing in this passage? At least with the first person. Telling him how it's going to be. He's telling him how it's going to be exactly. He's laying out the reality of the sacrifice. <coughs> and I think a lot of us fall into this purview when we say, "I'll follow you wherever you go." Peter certainly said that. He almost said the exact same kind of thing. And yet, what happened to him? He said on the night of the crucifixion, what did he do? He fell away, exactly. The spirit is one, but the flesh is weak. So sometimes we come to Jesus with this over-eager sense of discipleship, no matter what the cost, no matter what the terms, no matter what it said, I'm going to follow you. And then when the rubber hits the road, what do we realize about discipleship? We romanticized it. We romanticized it, but we didn't really have a, an honest opinion of it. And because we didn't have an honest opinion of it, we didn't have a re, re, realistic viewpoint of it, then what happens to us when we get knee deep in it? We look at Jesus, we throw up our hands, we say, this isn't really what I bargained for. 
This isn't really what I was after. And so Jesus, in this passage, doesn't discourage him. He just tries to make it real with him. And this is what it's going to cost. This is what it's going to be like. If you want to follow me, that's great. What happens with the second person? Because he's the follower. And the second one says, let me bury my father first. Right. He says, let him just basically go. Go and proclaim the kingdom. Right, I will, or he says to him, follow me. The, the second person says, when you go first and bury my father, it's ironic right, that we're having this conversation. Allow me first to go bury my father. Jesus says back to him, let the dead bury their own dead. Why does Jesus say that? This was the case. <coughs> what I'm saying is that back then, they lived until their father died. They lived with them. Yeah. <coughs> it's a procrastination. Mm -hmm. That's very much true in the times of Abraham. I don't know if it's true in the Greco Roman world, but it very well might be. And, and if so, that's the same kind of thing. It's procrastination. I can see this also. This, all right. Oh, yeah. yeah, it sounds like, hey, I'll follow you. Right. That will lead to it. I don't know how I can do this next. Right. Give me 10 minutes, and we go take care of this thing. Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't even have <laughs> yeah, not right now. I'll come back a little bit later. Yeah. There's there's been several speculations. People have said, well, he hasn't died yet, which is what Joe is, I think, kind of mentioning. So he's got to wait until he dies in a very morbid type of way. Got to wait until he's dead so that I can kind of assume my responsibilities and take care of the church and the household. <coughs> One thing you do, we do know about this time period is that they handle death very differently than we do. When somebody died, what they did with that body, and you see this in the, in the life and the death of Jesus. But they put the body in a tomb. They kind of lay it, they wrap it, they put it in a tomb. Then they give it a year. They come back a year later after the body is decomposed. They gather up the bones and put it in an ossuary, in a box. And they put that box in the shelf. And so there's some people that have said, well, he is waiting for maybe his father to die. I'm more of the second thing. Maybe his father's already dead. He's just waiting to kind of fulfill this other custom. And it's not something you find in the old law. It's not something that's decreed in the law of Moses. But it definitely is a custom in these time periods, where I've got a way to fulfill my obligation to my father. Does, is that a bad thing that that's what he wants to do? No. No. I don't think there's anything wrong with the fact that he wants to bury his father. That's his social, that's his familiar responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Their, their focus is on the physical rather than the spiritual thing. You see a little bit of Martha and Mary in there. They have chosen the good part. She's chosen the good part. We've chosen the other part. So you do see a little bit of that physical and spiritual. And that's essentially what Jesus is saying in this passage. He's saying, look, let the dead bury their own dead. They'll take care of that stuff. You follow me. This would have hit him like a ton of bricks. On not only in regards to his family, but in regards to his responsibility. The idea that I'm leaving even that to follow Jesus. I think that would have been uh, kind of a little shell shock. What's the third person say to him? I would follow you, Christ. I have to be. Right. Jesus isn't the one, and there's a lot more in this you know, six verse section than we're kind of exploring here. But Jesus doesn't say to him, follow. I don't think he says to him, follow me. Maybe he does. He says, I will follow you. Right. But. Right. This is the person that approaches Jesus. And that, that's what I'm sure about. He approaches Jesus and says, I will follow you wherever you go. But what? I want to say farewell before everybody else. What's the problem with this guy? He's still wrapped up in the past a little bit. He still kind of wants to keep his relationships. You're trying to avoid it over again. Right. I'm, I'm kind of going to keep getting dragged back to this life. There's a little bit of that, too. And I think the argument here is not just being a Christian, being a disciple. In fact, this point, you start to go and preach. Right. The idea of a discipleship is you go and preach to everybody. You don't just kind of live in this past world. You move forward. What's the biggest issue with this guy? What is he trying to do? That's true, yeah. Let me go first and bid for I mean, how many friends and family do you have? How long is it going to take? 10 minutes? Is it 10 years? Well, what if they're all the way in Syria? You got a long trip ahead of you. But yeah, send a pigeon for text. I think it just comes down to the fact that if 
in his initial coming to Christianity and we're coming to Christ, if he's willing to say, hold on, I'm going to run this by the family first, then whenever other sacrifices are going to need to be made, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to do it? Or are you going to say, well, I know what you're saying, but hold on. We run about the family first. Right. As long as it maintains either an equal setting or a higher setting than Christ, he is not, as he says, not fit for the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think that's. I think what you're saying is a little bit of uh, what they were saying too about the idea of kind of living in the past. But I think where you were going is kind of where I was at ultimately. It's the fact that there, this guy is trying to define discipleship on his terms. He's trying to say, Lord, I'll follow you, but we need to do all these other things first. That's a real problem with that because it's not discipleship anymore. What is it? If I try to define my relationship with Jesus on my terms, what is it? It stops being discipleship. What does it become? There's a lot of words I can fit. I was thinking customization. It becomes more customized. It becomes discipleship to me. It becomes what I want to do rather than what God wants me to do. And so the problem with these three people is one you know, has a vastly underest has vastly <coughs> underestimated what it means to be a disciple. The other one is trying to figure out what the object of his discipleship is. The third one is trying to define it on his terms. And that's the problem with all of us. All of us, if you if you're if we're being honest with ourselves, we can look at this and see ourselves a little bit in this. When we try to say, well, I'll follow you, but, or I'll follow you, but let me hold on to this. We can see ourselves in this, I think, over and over again. Um, when you look at these three, I think it goes very well and kind of with kind of three big points as a whole, this is just kind of extrapolated. Sometimes we vastly underestimate the cost. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 16. We'll skip Acts 14. Look at Acts from Matthew chapter 16. chapter 16, starting in verse 24. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 24. He says that Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, whoever wishes, or whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with an angel, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. What is, what's happening here in Matthew chapter 16? Is this a pessimistic section, or what is this? There's no compromise. Right. We, we, do it our, we do it God's way, or we don't do it at all. Right. We underestimate the cost, and we say, well, it's only going to cost me this much, and then we think it's, we realize it's going to cost me more than that. But is this passage a pessimistic phrase by Jesus? Is he trying to discourage people? It's a matter of fact, for sure. There's no getting around it. This is the way it is. But what is he trying to get them to do? To truly realize what this what discipleship will cost. Not right. just initially, but from this point on. Right. He's trying to get them to see what discipleship will cost. And I think to jump on that point a little bit more, he's trying to get them to see that what it will cost is worth what you'll get in the end. It's, it's worth so much more. When you look at verse 25, he says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. In other words, the things that you give up are the things that sometimes you need to give up in order to find something greater. Just. It's the classic risk-reward ratio. Right. The greater the risk, the greater the reward, the less right. the risk, the less reward. I understood that analogy. Yes. There's a, there's a risk-reward scenario. Is, is the risk greater than the reward? In this case... Absolutely not. The risk is minuscule. You can look at Paul's labors that he goes into in 2 Corinthians for this, but the risk is small compared to the glory that, that awaits us, and that's what he's really trying to gravitate towards. We also sometimes follow the wrong teacher. We discuss that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, lust, sensuality, pride, all those things are inherent within that. And it, I think sometimes those things kind of destroy what we're supposed to be. We think we're following Jesus, when in reality we're following what we want to do. I think you see that a little bit there. We also sometimes want to follow Jesus on our terms. You don't have to look at it, but I want you on your own time to read John 21, 15 down to verse 23. Because in that whole discussion where Jesus says, tend my sheep, tend my sheep, tend my sheep, he's showing him what discipleship means. And the next breath, he says, you'll go sometimes where you don't want to be taken. You'll gird where you're going to be girded and dragged off where you don't want to be dragged off to. That's what discipleship is about. And so when Peter says, follow me, there's a lot more, or when Jesus is following me, there's a lot more in that than just, oh, I'll follow you. You need to understand what it costs. One thing we need to understand, too, and there's two more points I want to make very quickly. The one thing that I need us to understand 
is that discipleship needs to come with a rewards mentality. I don't mean in the Joel Osteen manner of horse dropping in your front or your driveway. What I do mean is that discipleship needs to come with an understanding that whatever you give up will be more than worth it in the life to come. That's what you see ingrained in us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. One of the conversations Jesus has with Peter, you will not lose this, and you will gain a thousand more things in this life, and then the life to come, eternal life. But what we also are looking for when we talk about discipleship, this is the <laughs> one kind of idea that will go over the entire quarter. What we're after is a transformation. That's what we're after. You can't live your life of the world and, and the value systems and the hopes and the things that you have in this world, you know, the relationships that we sometimes have, the, the hope that we sometimes have. We can't have this stuff and still expect to be a fully devoted disciple of Christ. We have to be transformed. We have our hopes and our, our values and our thoughts. Everything about us is different. And so it's not overstating, overstating the case at all. That <coughs> this quarter, hopefully, will change your life. That's a great point. Right now. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Man, it's not, it's not going to happen passively. It's going to have to be something that, and you can do an excellent job up here, but if we just sit here listening and do nothing with it, there will right. be no transformation that happens. It is going to be up to each and every one of us to take <coughs> what we hear and allow that to work, and to put it to work. Right. And that's kind of the point that we, we made more towards the beginning when we were talking about how you know, it can be very easy to say I'm a disciple, but if you're not growing, if you're not learning, then you're not really a disciple. I'm not a disciple. So it is a process. That's a good point. All right, we will pick up with our new class.